tell you a little bit about one of the uh, research areas that we're involved with. Thank you. Scalable energy. It also forms the basis of one of the five clusters that you've probably heard about. So what we want to do is just tell you a little bit more about what that topic involves. So thank you very much. So here we go for uh, societal needs of scalable energy. And first what I want to do is, is put a little backdrop out there and tell you what scalable energy is all about. First I have to talk about the paradigm of today's big energy. So can I have the next slide? Or I, maybe I can do it. Yes, I can. So whether you know it or not, this is the way you get most of your energy. Chemical process engineers typically like to scale things to very large sizes to improve the thermodynamic efficiency and also drop the cost. So typically what happens is things scale to a fractional power, like the 0.6 power. So what that basically means is to, to get a decent sized plant, we'll look at one example. This is going to be for gas to liquids, GTL. Some of you are familiar with fischer tropsch synthesis, how South Africa and a lot of other places in the world derive their liquid fuels from non-fuel sources, such as coal, biomass, uh, or stranded ga or gas. But basically, today's paradigm is such that if you want to make one of these plants economical, you have to go to about 100,000 barrels per day. And the capex, the cost to build that plant, is quite capital intensive. It's about 125 dollars to $200,000 per barrel. You multiply those two numbers together and you get something like $20 billion. And when you have an investment that's, that's that large, it turns out that you can only locate those plants a very few places in the world where you have your supply chain and your distribution infrastructure in place. When those things don't match up, what happens? So I don't know if you can see, the lights are kind of bright. If you could kill them, it'd be better. But uh, here's a map, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen it. It's just a satellite photo of the continental US. And you see something glowing very bright in North Dakota, and also this crescent here in West Texas. Well, this is the Bakken Formation, and that's the Eagleford. And for you and your grandkids and your grandkids' grandkids, those energy sources, as you know, will change their lives because we have a great deal of energy, all right? But what's going on here? Those are not cows, and these, this is not Santa Anta getting ready to, to retake the Alamo. Basically, behind every one of those lights is something that looks like this, and I always like to say it's a bit trite, but a picture is worth a thousand words. Liquids are easy to collect, they store in tanks, and they're easily transportable. But a gas pipeline, particularly for a small amount of gas, is a capital of expense of about $2 million per mile, and that may be an intermittent source. So you don't still put down pipeline and pull it up. So the question is, this is worth six to eight times per BTU because it's in liquid form. It's a more valuable liquid fuel, right? Transportation needs, things like that. And gas sells at a fraction. So in these particular cases, the technology of choice today is to flare it. That's preferable. The non-preferable <laughs> opportunity or option is really to vent it. And the global warming cross-section of methane is, what, 24 times higher than it is for a stoichiometric amount of CO2 and water. So you've got a fundamental challenge here, right? And the goal is to supply the country and the energy with its need for fuels. Um, and the other thing, you know, you should note that uh, uh, people are becoming very aware of this. It's becoming a part of our national energy po policy. The White House is very much aware of it. The DOE is aware of it. I'm not going to read through all this. A number of panels and, and have been assembled for public commentary. What are we going to do about this problem? 35% of the gas being brought to the surface in those two formations is being flared, wasted, nothing really going on with it. So what do we do to change that? And, uh, and I'll say a little bit more about the market size here in a second. Uh, this is the amount of gas that's flared by oil and gas. This is kind of an old number. And uh, I think it's actually collected from EIA. And if I look into the data, it's probably grossly underestimated. But basically, it says that of the bill, uh, we're doing about 278 billion cubic feet of gas that's being uh, flared by the oil and gas industry. The Bakken alone, with old 2011 statistics, is 47 billion cubic feet. How big is this number? That number is big enough to power the Washington, D.C., Metroplex, and Delaware and Maryland about 10 times over. So this is not a small amount of energy, and it's also a, a significant environmental concern. So let's do something, right, to capture this flared uh, gas. Well, it turns out the problem is even more interesting than that, and therefore is a tremendous synergy and opportunity for the university. Turns out oil and gas, is, as large as, as that is, 
is now becoming comparable to the amount of gas that is vented by our landfills. There's 52 landfills in Alabama, only one of which is doing anything to combust the gas to make steam and sell it to Redstone Arsenal. The rest is just being vented into the atmosphere. That's roughly equivalent to 120,000 barrels of oil per day CO2 equivalent and a tremendous amount of energy opportunity. Uh, and then you can go through other things, coal mine vented, manure management, wastewater treatment. I'll throw some numbers in there. It's kind of an eye chart, but you can even calibrate Mother Earth, all right, in terms of the teragrams of CO2 equivalent or carbon equivalent. So this is a big issue, and what an opportunity to do something about capturing those energy sources. So here's what our cluster is doing, what a lot of our research programs are involved with uh, here on campus, is the goal is to de-bottleneck these stranded energy sources. So what's the full list? Ag and forest product wastes or biomass, landfill gas, anaerobic digester gas. Uh, there's 8,200 sites, potential sites in the US. Only 147 are doing anything to harvest that gas, all right? Uh, food wastes, coal wastes, flare gas. And remember, flare gas is produced in association with petroleum, associated petroleum. If you lock up the gas, you actually lock up 500 to 1,000 times more value in petroleum. So, it's, so it is a big issue. So what's the need here? Well, we need to break the paradigm, the traditional chemical process engineering paradigm. The goal here, or the need, is a hundred barrel per day plant. Not 100,000, but 100 barrel per day plant at a significantly lower level of capex, 30 to $50,000 per barrel. That means that the capital expense here, you multiply those two numbers, it's very modest. It's only three to $5 million, fits within the realm of a municipal landfill, uh, a corporate farm, a lot of different resource allocations, right? So what I've just given to you, and I want to apologize about this a little bit, is I've given you a technological goal. And sometimes in a university setting, you catch all kinds of grief for talking about a technological goal. The way I like to remember this is that President Kennedy said, you know, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. The quote was not, we're going to invent microelectronics, inertial guidance, and new alloys for rocket nozzles. All of those were spin outs. So the construct that we want to use to address this goal is to take the technological goal use a simple technique known as use-inspired basic research. What are the fundamental limitations and problems that keep us from doing this? Take them over here. Uh, I think I violated the Auburn University logo code by putting letters over the official logo. So please, you're, you're allowed to turn me in. I'll just add it to the list of crimes. But uh, anyway, solve the problems here in the fundamental setting and transform them back in the technology world. This is a wonderful way for us, right, to interact with our stakeholders. Our stakeholders lie out here, right? Make, make no mistake. These are the folks that pay the bills. So what are the fundamental areas that have to be addressed? It's a long list here, starting with ab initio quantum mechanics, molecular level catalysis, new and superior forms of chemical process industry. Instead of having separate units, we want to put three or four different chemical operations within a single process unit and achieve a great economy of scale and savings. But these are sound and, and, and uh, actually daunting uh, fundamental challenges. So it's a rich environment for academic research, scholarly activities, although they do have an application that shouldn't be bad, but they do, and uh, just a great opportunity to serve stakeholders. And now I want to, uh, my last minute, just give you an example. I framed the problem. I should just show you an example of what, for example, of what we do. So what we do is we take small grains of catalyst. People don't realize that 95% of all the chemical catalytic processes operating that service our needs are either under mass transport restrictions or heat transport limitations. So we take catalysts, we grind them up finer than a grain of sand. So they have extremely high surface areas, external, very high catalytic activities, and we embed them in micron diameter wires. Those are like 10, 12 micron. Those are actually pretty big, but that's about one third the diameter of a human hair. And we can make these structures, and believe it or not, we've modified traditional paper making equipment, which is prevalent all across the Southeast. So we got a lot of jobs already with a vested interest, right, in this particular technology. And we can throw all these neat materials in there and spin it out on rolls of paper, recycle all our wastes. It's a very neat manufacturing operation. 
high volume and extremely robust. And then this is just an example of what we do. We're able, this is the, and I, a little bit of data here, but that's looking at the overall thermal conductance of a packed bed reactor. A traditional packed bed reactor to do gas to liquids is 0.17 to 0.21 watts per meter Kelvin, thermal conductivity. We're able to achieve numbers 250 times higher than that, which means we can scale these reactors out and get the heat out. Oh, by the way, that Fischer-Tropsch reaction, gas to liquid, it's got an adiabatic heat reaction of 1,300 degrees Kelvin. So it's a very massive operation done inside a heat exchanger manifold. We're able to do that far simpler, far fewer part counts, much less expensively. And this is just some data that we collect. We work extensively with industry. We have industrial partners. We run pilot plants in a number of facilities all across the country, including this thing over here, the National Carbon Capture Center, operated by Southern Company, sits in Wilsonville, Alabama. We're running out of slipstream there. So finally, this is a summary for my talk. Scalable energy conversion, I hope to tell you, has many societal benefits, meets critical energy needs. Our country, our society, economic development all over the world re revolves around clean, inexpensive, widely available energy. But we can actually get that from sources that we used to waste and reduce emissions at the same time. So there's a multi-fold savings in there that I could outline to you uh, more. And also, use-inspired basic research, contemplating fundamentals that have real application toward our stakeholders, is a, it, it really connects the core skills of the university with our customers. Thank you very much. Be happy to answer any questions.